an organizer and union rep for the Communication Workers of America. And I'm here with uh, another longtime comrade and uh, fellow union activist from Boston, Brother Rand Wilson, who now works for my old union, CWA, also the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and the National AFL-CIO. I'll explain that later. <laughs> Okay, well, um, why don't I uh, start things off? We're going to keep this very short so we can uh, have uh, uh, mainly discussion here because we've clearly got uh, an experienced group of local activists from uh, the campus and the community and from the local labor movement, and I think it would be most productive to, to have an exchange uh, rather than listen to uh, a couple of uh, out-of-town uh, uh, past or present union officials do what union officials uh, do best, which is... Uh, talk at uh, endless length. Uh, <laughs> we've all been subjected to that, so we don't need to have uh, too much of it here today. Um, I want to thank uh, the sponsors, uh, all the different uh, individuals and organizations that uh, came together to put on this conference and uh, actually said something uh, for me the other day at the Hinckley Institute. I think it's uh, really a great um, thing to see uh, a gathering integrate the issues and concerns of, uh, of labor activists, of environmental activists, of peace activists. Um, back in Boston, where Rand and I uh, come from, um, folks from all these different movements would uh, more likely to be meeting separately and coalescing less. I mean, I guess in a in a blue state beehive of progressive political activity, people can afford to have four or five or six different conferences, each dealing with their own kind of single issue. Uh, the downside of that is that people don't learn from each other and they don't have, hopefully, uh, the basis uh, that is going to come out of this conference for uh, more kind of cross-movement work with each other. Um, we've been asked to discuss today, or just say a few words to kick off a discussion of um, strategies for reviving uh, the union movement, both as an effective uh, vehicle for workers securing a greater measure of justice on the job, uh, day in and day out, and uh, also for reviving the labor movement as a force for progressive social change. Um, you know, it seems like most folks uh, in the room here today, because of their own past union experience or their political activity, probably uh, would agree that the progressive movement in this country uh, would be stronger if we had a bigger labor movement rather than a smaller one. Uh, in the early 1950s, we had uh, a third of the workforce organized. We're down to about 12 percent overall today. Had uh, some terrible losses uh, last year due to the recession. There was a 10 percent decline in private sector union membership, mainly due to uh, job cuts in construction and manufacturing. So uh, the current 35 to 40 year decline in membership, uh, particularly in the private sector, uh, continues, accelerated in the last uh, 12 to 18 months as a result of the uh, terrible economy. Um, certainly one key to reviving vibrant community labor coalitions, whether in your state or ours back in Massachusetts, where Rand and I have been involved in building jobs with justice for the last several decades, uh, <coughs> is creating uh, cross-union networks of uh, activists, um, creating or trying to recreate a, a culture of, of solidarity that brings together uh, people from community organizations and, and from unions and unorganized workers as well. Uh, to help win strikes where there are still strikes, uh, to support contract negotiations, uh, to aid new union organizing, which really is going to be the only way that at some point uh, we're going to start to rebuild our ranks in either the private or public sector, and to support uh, workers on an individual or group basis in non-union workplaces who are standing up for their rights, who are fighting uh, various types of labor law violations, Many parts of this country, as you know, this kind of work is done not just by Jaws with Justice coalitions, but the wonderful network of, uh, of worker centers that in many, many parts of the U.S. Uh, focus on the problems of, uh, of immigrant workers and uh, help organize a fight back against their fairly widespread exploitation. 
Um, both the labor movement and the justice movement, as you know, have had a major setback lately in the area of private sector labor law reform. Um, I want to hand out a, a piece that uh, you know, I did about this uh, a couple of weeks ago for our hometown rag, the, uh, the Boston Globe. Um, it's uh, an op-ed piece from several weeks ago in the wake of the uh, Massachusetts Senate special election that, uh, surprisingly enough, put a Republican into Ted Kennedy's seat, kind of upset the apple cart in Washington, D.C., uh, deprived uh, the Obama administration and its union backers of the 60th vote necessary in the Senate to have a kind of supermajority uh, to overcome any Republican filibuster. Um, this has created a, a very adverse uh, chain of events. Uh, first of all, obviously a setback to uh, the labor law reform project, whatever we may think about that. I'm sure we're going to talk about that more. But uh, major collateral damage in the form of the Employee Free Choice Act, which many of us in the labor movement have been working on as a campaign to strengthen private sector organizing and bargaining rights for the last two to three years, we're now told that with only 59 votes in the Senate, uh, basically we don't have uh, sufficient political support to enact it. Uh, we had the additional spectacle uh, this week of a pro-labor uh, Obama administration appointee to the National Labor Relations Board uh, failing to get sufficient number of votes for his uh, nomination to be ratified. And another setback, since the usual plan B of supposedly labor-friendly Democratic administrations, whether it was Jimmy Carter 30 years ago or Bill Clinton in the 1990s or now the Obama administration, when they can't change the law, and that has been a reoccurring uh, pattern of failure over 35 years, uh, they at least offer their labor supporters uh, supposedly stronger enforcement of the National Labor Relations Act through more worker-friendly appointments to the National Labor Relations Board, which is the federal agency that enforces uh, the, the Wagner Act or the NLRA. And uh, we're not even seeing that materialize at a very swift rate uh, so far under the Obama administration, though to be fair and balanced, as they are on Fox News always, uh, there has been some good appointments in the Department of Labor and uh, some other labor-oriented initiatives by Obama that are definitely an improvement over what we uh, saw under eight years with Bush. Um, I just want to close by saying a couple things about what I think is one of the major challenges facing uh, people uh, who are labor supporters or labor activists. And it's certainly been on display in, in the week or so that uh, Rand and I have uh, been here. And that's the, uh, the major threat and challenge posed by the attack on, on public sector jobs and uh, employee benefits and services. And that's a kind of related, multi-pronged uh, conservative corporate offensive. Uh, you know, you can see it uh, <laughs> in the, uh, you know, the local newspaper headlines here. Uh, pick up uh, any issue of the Salt Lake Tribune uh, the last couple of days. Uh, you know, hundreds of uh, jobs of teachers and school employees uh, at risk in one of the major school districts. Uh, public safety uh, budget cutbacks uh, threatened. Um, cutbacks in, in Medicaid that would affect uh, 10,000 uh, pregnant women and uh, families with disabled children. Uh, you know, we had a tremendous rally here uh, in Salt Lake a week ago. Thousands of teachers, firefighters, police officers, and other state employees uh, rallying against these bills that seem to be still moving through the state legislature to uh, cut back their pension benefits. Seems to me going around the country on a little book tour in the last six or seven months, this is not a situation unique to your state. This is happening everywhere in the public sector. And the challenge for public employees, whether they are police, firefighters, state workers, university employees, uh, local public school teachers, is to uh, turn this defense uh, of, of their own jobs and the public services that they provide and the decent pay and benefits that they deserve for providing those public services into a broader fight. Because if uh, they don't, um, eight million people have lost their jobs in the last 18 months, uh, many of them in the private sector. Uh, they are resentful, understandably, about that. They are tax-strapped. 
uh, they are suffering, they're losing their homes, uh, and uh, clearly there's an effort to pit um, beleaguered private sector workers, many of them now jobless, against uh, the public workforce and to scapegoat uh, 